Hi everyone. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us this afternoon for a Lead Free Ohio training. We're excited that you all were able to join and we wanted to take the time to thank the Ohio Department of Health for their support with this project. And we, I will go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. We have Marie Masoda. Um, she is a senior research coordinator at the University Hospitals Rainbow Center for Children, um, Child Health and Policy, where she manages research, quality, and community-based projects. She represents UH Rainbow in several multi-sectoral community partnerships focused, focused on child health and health equity. Her research interests focus on child and family health and well-being community-based participatory methods in health equity. Dr. Dieter Sumrauer is a regional medical, medical director at the, at the Rainbow Primary Care Institute and the medical director of the Amb Ambulatory Electronic Medical Record for UH Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. He is also the lead physician for LED at University Hospitals Health Systems and represents University Hospitals on various community and state organizations, as well as policy matters pertaining to LED. So we're so excited to have both of them here today. Um, during this time, please keep your cameras off and your lines muted. If you have questions, please feel free to put those into the chat box and we will get to those um, at the end of the training. At this time, I will go ahead and pass it off. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I hope that uh, we'll be able to shed some light on an old problem. Um, I think our talk is going to come at it from the beginning all over again, uh, as I think it's something we're all aware of, but maybe something we might have um, forgotten about. Neither Ms. Masocha or myself have any disclosures talking about anything off-label today. To get started, um, so Dr. Samara, you're frozen, I believe. We will give him just a minute to <laughs> be able to come back in. I hope he's to know. Uh, is lead poisoning a problem in your service area? Is that something that you deal with? And Dr. Samrauer, you were frozen for just a little bit there, ah, okay. um, but I'm going to pull up your polling question. <laughs> can, you, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. So as I said, we'd like to know sort of who's here today, who's joining us, and perhaps where you're joining us from, so we get an idea of the state are represented on the call. <clears throat> And then also we'd like to know if lead poisoning is a problem in your service area. So we've got a lot of MDs, some NPs, nurses, community health workers, great, wonderful. And is lead poisoning a problem in your service area? Is this something that uh, you perceive to be an issue? <clears throat> I'm taking the survey right along with all of you. <laughs> Great, thank you. And said no, 78% with yes, and about 13% of those on the call are unsure. So great, hopefully we can um, change our perceptions about that today. And finally, do you have a workflow to address lead testing in your practice? Is this something that you consider your practice is currently doing successfully, not successfully? Do you have something laid out <clears throat> for how to address this issue in your population? Awesome. 
Very good. 59% of the people on the call today have a workflow in place. So that's fantastic. I'd like to bring that number up and see if we can get 100% of all of us um, by the end of the call. <clears throat> so our main focus today is going to be understanding the ubiquity of lead in society and the importance of testing to not only treat, but also better identify the geography of lead contamination. We'll touch on the mechanism of lead poisoning and its effects. Great research by our colleagues in Cincinnati and elsewhere has established the details of how lead affects the developing brain and the long-term effects of lead poisoning. But today, I really want to drive home the continued pervasiveness of lead contamination as a public health crisis and the importance of testing to improve outcomes for individuals and for society. I hope for us all to contemplate our perceptions of lead contamination in our local areas and how we are failing in improving this millennia old problem and how we can improve what we are doing. What is lead? Lead is a naturally occurring heavy metal that is abundant in our earth. Throughout history, it's been used widely to improve the human condition. It's been used in products from cooking utensils to paint to gasoline. But lead is a dangerous heavy metal that, on a microscopic level, once absorbed in the human body, competes with calcium and calcium channels, leading to altered calcium levels in our cells. In our brains, this changes the transmission of neurosignals, causes cell death, and leads to decreased gray matter. On a more macroscopic level, the overall effects of lead in the human body include heart disease, infertility, and miscarriage, as well as neurocognitive disorders such as developmental delay and CMS damage. Lead has been linked to ADHD, problems with decision-making, and increased lifetime risk for crime. Perhaps the greatest cost to the individual and society, and arguably the driver behind many of these problems linked to lead, is a decrease in IQ from lead poisoning. An inverse relationship between lead exposure and intellectual functioning has been established. The greatest decrements occur at the lowest levels of lead exposure. Here, this log linear model of IQ for concurrent blood lead concentration with the 95th percentile confidence interval shaded in light blue taken from Lanfear and all in 2005 demonstrates the decreases in IQ with increasing levels of lead exposure. The study authors after adjusting for covariates found the greatest decrease in IQ with the lowest levels of lead exposure demonstrating a 3.9 point decrease in IQ for blood lead levels increased from 2.5, excuse me, 2.4, about the same, to 10 micrograms per deciliter. The economic impact of these effects of lead exposure and poisoning is staggering. And the lifetime total impact per age cohort has been estimated to be between 192 and $270 billion nationally showing a breakdown on the slide here of how we come to those numbers. It's really quite staggering. For Ohio, the lifetime economic burden per age cohort has been estimated to be $2.8 billion. The first descriptions of acute lead poisoning date back to the second century BCE. During the Renaissance and then the Industrial Revolution, the scientific and medical communities began to recognize the effects of acute lead poisoning in artisans and workers. But it wasn't until 1960 when the CDC issued the first recommendation for restricting blood lead levels in children. The first restriction in 1960 recommended an acceptable blood lead level of 60 micrograms per deciliter. And over the last 60 years, the recommended acceptable blood lead levels have continued to decrease. And these decreases in recommended acceptable blood lead levels have coincided with societal interventions, such as the phasing out of leaded gasoline and the restriction of lead in construction materials and the banning of lead in house paint. Most recently, the CDC lowered the acceptable blood lead level to 3.5 micrograms per deciliter in 2021. So why does lead continue to be a public health threat? Is lead simply limited to the events like the headline grabbing crises in Flint, Michigan and in Newark, New Jersey? No. At the height of the lead catastrophe in Flint, Michigan, 7% of children tested in Flint had elevated blood lead levels. This compared to 14.2% of children in Cleveland at the same time. But lead poisoning is not limited to Cleveland alone. 
It is in all of our urban areas and in our rural counties. In fact, lead is in every corner of our state. <clears throat> Excuse me. Policy Matters points out that Ohio has the second highest share of children afflicted with lead poisoning among all 50 states, with 5.2% of Ohio kids being lead poisoned compared to a national average of 1.9%. The reason for this continued ongoing public health crisis is the legacy of our millennia of lead use, as well as the influx of lead contaminated products from other countries. Additionally, some occupations remain at high risk for lead contamination and lead poisoning. But in Ohio, perhaps the single most Dr. Samara, you're paused. Age of 1972 or older. Great for tourists who want to look at old homes, not so great for our kids. Great. So, um, and I think that what, what Dr. Sommerauer was iterating we might have missed was just that the, the age of housing stock in Ohio is one of the biggest um, issues when it comes to lead poisoning. It's very hard to remediate, fully remediate um, or eradicate red, lead from old houses. And so often we just do um, you know, painting over top of them, which then gets re-exposed. And so lead poisoning is also an environmental justice issue. Um, you know, often disproportionately affects our lowest income and African American children. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit through these maps that are here. So this is just an example and it, it covers a Northeast Ohio area. Um, the area of you know, highest rates of lead poisoning in Cuyahoga County are in neighborhoods with a history of housing law discrimination and, and racial segregation. We had systematic divestment in these predominantly immigrant and African American neighborhoods which is associated with poorly maintained housing stock and other neighborhood infrastructure. Um, the upper map is an example of those created by government sponsored homeowners loan corporation and federal home loan bank board in the 1930s and 40s. And these red and yellow areas were areas deemed um, as you know, very risky or too risky for investment. Um, and then in the lower map, you see the density of children under six with lead poisoning um, and that those that in the highest density um, correlate with those with the red and yellow areas from these earlier redlining maps. So the areas where the most children are being lead poisoned and in this example in Northeast Ohio are really in these areas that have over decades been, you know, seen a lot of divestment, whether intentional or unintentional, just because corporations and entities are, are not investing in, in those communities as much. Um, we know, like I said, that lead poisoning in Ohio is often the result of paint or dirt surrounding houses um, that have previously been painted with lead. And um, that this covering over of lead paint often exposes the lead again and with increased risks. Many of our families do um, rent homes and rent what they can afford and not always, it, um, is, it, is there even an awareness whether there are um, issues with the housing where a, a, a family is being exposed. If a family owns a home, often they might not be able to afford to um, do home improvements when lead paint is exposed. So our most vulnerable children are often paying the price by um, being exposed to lead without even knowing it. Next slide. Um, so policy interventions really matter here. And so um, we just have some of those on this slide. Um, and these have significantly reduced the amount of lead poisoning um, in, in the United States and have reduced the amount of lead that we are finding in children. However, there are still 500,000 children with elevated blood levels in the United States. Um, so how do we combat this public health crisis?
Oh, Dr. Samara, you're pa uh, muted, not paused. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I, was having, I think I had some internet issues. I apologize. Um, so how do we combat this prevention uh, through abatement of lead in the environment is the single most important way to prevent lead poisoning. Research has suggested that every dollar invested in lead paint hazard control results in a return of 17 to $221. But until we ensure that our environment is safe, we need to intervene by diagnosing those affected. Lead screening and testing is important for several reasons. First and foremost, to identify those children with elevated blood lead levels, to enroll them in appropriate treatments to reduce those lead levels as rapidly as possible. Is it all safe to assume that prolonged exposure to lead will have only increasing detrimental effects? It is, and it is also the right thing to assume. We know from studies in adults that prolonged increased blood lead levels can lead to decreased renal function, increased risk for hypertension, hearing loss, tremors, miscarriage, and infertility. <clears throat> A study of children in Charlotte, North Carolina, published in 2018, found that every $1 spent on interventions for children with elevated blood lead levels yielded a return of $1.40 in savings of those economic costs we touched on earlier. In addition, Improved testing will improve our understanding of the geographic areas that need our attention most for abatement. With improved data, we will be able to better direct societal investment to prevent further lead poisoning. In 1991, the CDC called for universal testing of all children 12 to 72 months of age. By 1994, a national survey revealed that only 24% of children had been screened. And by 1997, those recommendations had been pulled back and we no longer required universal screening. Current Medicaid requirements are that all children with Medicaid insurance be tested at 12 and 24 months or between 36 and 72 months if no previous test was obtained. Current Ohio law reflects the changes to the recommendations for made in 1997 to screen all children at one and two years of age and children 36 to 72 months of age who have not previously been tested if they receive Medicaid or assistance from WIC live in a high risk zip code, or the parents or guardians answer yes to personal risk questions um, on the questionnaire. Uh, as listed by the Ohio Department of Health, <clears throat> the blood testing requirements questionnaire. The AAP does recommend um, screening children at six, nine, 12, 15, 18, 24 months, and then three through six years as well. So based on Ohio law, although we know that the burden of lead poisoning is greater among lower socioeconomic levels, we cannot rely on insurance alone to guide our testing decisions. So we need to be able to consider, again, like Dr. Somerauer said, whether a child lives in a high risk zip code or has other risk factors specified by the Ohio Department of Health. So um, the Ohio Department of Health questionnaire seen here is meant to guide your decision on whether to test. The backside identifies those high-risk zip codes, which are determined based on whether that um, zip code has um, a certain percentage of housing that is housing that was from the lead era. Uh, it takes very minimal left effort for parents to complete this screener, and it provides additional information to the clinical team. Um, and while a recent meta-analysis looking at effectiveness of screeners in terms of identifying more children with elevated blood lead levels could not find an effect, screeners can still be a very useful tool to help both educate parents more on what, what you're doing in terms of making sure that their child does not, has not been exposed to lead, and also on just the process of, of lead testing. Um, they may also improve compliance with Ohio law to test children in high risk zip codes, um, as well as those on Medicaid or with these different risk factors. And this might be uh, particularly important in practices that do not have a way to flag patients easily in the medical record to indicate um, the child needs a test. And there has been research done that has looked at practices and um, looked at uh, children who have come into a practice and needed a lead test but still didn't get that test. And so again, having the screener available during well child visits to just make sure that the child has been um, tested if they need to is something that you can use. But testing rates continue to be woefully low. 
This data shows the number of children in Ohio at the age of 72 months and the number of those children that had lead tests obtained. Though I don't have data on the actual number of children under the age of 72 months who are enrolled in Medicaid, according to the Ohio Children's Hospital Association, 1.25 million children rely on Medicaid for healthcare coverage, or nearly half of Ohio's 2.6 million children. If we use this information, we can assume that in 2018, approximately 418,000 children should have been tested for lead poisoning, but only about 168,000 were leaving 60% of children under the age of 72 months who should have been tested for lead poisoning untested. To further worsen matters, the pandemic contributed to decreased testing. You can see here the drop off from 2018 to 19 and 20 and on. 21 and 22 aren't quite done yet. So getting a little bit more local, and again, this data I'm going to share with you is from Northeast Ohio area and comes from our regional development um, health collaborative, Better Health Partnership. So we were curious as to how we were doing with lead screen, you know, lead ordering and testing. And the first step to understand the problem is really to um, look at it. At it locally. So we um, have something called our Child Health Initiative, and it collects data um, every year on every child that has been seen in a family medicine or pediatric practice in these different um, uh, health systems or practices. And so we did a pilot in 2020. And so this data is from that pilot. And we were asking the question, does a child seen in a pediatric or family medicine practice have a lead order in their chart? And does a child have a lead result? And is there an elevated lead level? So we looked at, um, in this data, you'll see about 18,000 children ages one to three residing in Cuyahoga County with, with one or more virtual, uh, in-person or virtual visit in 2020. And those um, systems or practices that participated in this were um, university hospitals, Metro Health, Care Alliance, and neighborhood family practice. So it doesn't include all of our kids that might have been seen in, in one of those practices, but just those practices. And we looked at their two most recent capillary tests, um, the date that the lab was ordered, the date it was drawn, and then the result, and then their two most recent venous tests, the date that the lab was ordered, the date that it was drawn, and the result. And the data that you'll see really suggests um, definite room for improvement in both um, percent of lead orders completed for children who would be considered at high risk and percent of lead testing that, um, you know, so actual results for children at high risk. Um, some of you might not be as um, excited about data and graphs as I am, so I will talk through them um, and um, we'll go to the next slide. So in this slide, um, we identified children at, that were re requiring a lead test, and those are in red. Those that weren't required, it doesn't mean that clinically a clinician didn't feel there was a need for it. It just means they don't fall in those um, Ohio Department of Health requirements of either being in a high-risk zip code or Medicaid insured. Um, so regionally, about 85% of children requiring a test had one order as seen in the first red bar. And um, the rest of the bars uh, relate to rainbow. And so at rainbow, while some pediatric practice cons practices consistently ordered lead tests for children who required them, such as the two high-performing practices in the middle, most of our practices were missing many required lead tests and all of the practices had room for improvement. There was also variation by practice and clinician in lead ordering. So here each dot represents either a practice on the left side or a clinician on the right side with the X axis displaying how many patients required a test and then the Y axis showing the percent with the lead order. So practice A and B that are in this blue and um, red, you can see are relatively high performing. Um, clinicians consistently ordered tests in practice A but in practice B, there's a lot more variation as you can, or as you can see by the red dots representing a clinician. And then here we also can see variation by lead orders completed. So regionally 78% of our, um, our children that had a lead ordered had a test result in their chart. Um, and then 
um, in our teaching practice at, at Rainbow, 88% of those children with a lead order had a result. But in many of our other practices, there was a lot of variation in the, the average you know, result that we've, we found when we put those together, 57% um, had, a, had ordered a test, but the child received that test and, and the number did not. Um, and then if you look on the other side, you're seeing children who were required a test. So how many of the children required a test received a test? So again, of those that needed a test based on Ohio law, only 78% in our teaching practice got that test and many less, 35% um, in our other practices. So at Rainbow, we have a lot of room for improvement as well. And uh, Dr. Summerall will talk about one of our strategies later. And again, a uh, variation among children um, in terms of both in practices as well as in, within clinicians in terms of how many of those children actually uh, had a lead result. And there's a lot of neighborhood variation in our region too in terms of which high-risk children are getting tested. The dark red shaded areas have the lowest testing percentages and data suggests that children on the west side of Cleveland and its suburbs um, at high risk have a lower percentage of completed tests than those on the east side. Um, this slide is very powerful in showing that there may be misconceptions about lead poisoning and lead contamination and who needs a test. Although this is pilot data, it does show that we're doing, a, we seem to be doing a little bit better effort, better job in the inner city areas, making sure that we're testing children, but not necessarily in the suburban areas where there might also be um, high, you know, children living in, in high risk areas. So knowing all that we know about lead and its burden to individuals in society, why do we continue to fail at testing? Um, you might have your own thoughts on this. These are just a few that we've put up here. The most common reason, about 70%, for not testing Medicaid enrolled children was the physician's belief that the practice is a low risk, in a low risk area. Yet 35% of those who do not test because they practice in a low risk area actually have their main practice site in a high risk area. So there's just these misperceptions. Um, parents as well might not be informed about the effects of lead poisoning um, and populations at highest risk also experience bar barriers to care, whether it be in transportation or time constraints that give parents untenable decision points between deciding whether to obtain a lab or to move on with their day. Um, and I will say here as well, there can be very much concern among parents who understand or are concerned that if their child tests elevated for lead, their child might be taken away. Um, they might be reported, they may have to vacate their house. So there are some other reasons why parents might choose not to test. Other issues may just be that they're concerned. They, they don't like blood draws. They don't want their child to be in pain. Um, and there's also um, perceptions and there are also challenges to testing as we pointed out with just being able to even know whether a child needs to be tested or not. If we don't have a workflow or you just, you know, you have a lot of patients to see in one day, and there isn't a way in the electronic medical record to be able to see easily that this patient doesn't have a lead test, um, it might go on with, without being um, ordered. Um, the other challenge we have, um, for sure in our area where we have a lot of different practices and, and health systems is we don't have an easy way to see right within the medical record if the child had a lead test done in another practice that isn't one of um, our, our, say, UH practices. The other uh, challenge is just that it doesn't, the, there, there aren't a lot of um, advantage, advantages from a practice side, which obviously this shouldn't be a big concern, but it doesn't pay very much. So it might not be something that's encouraged by a system as something to focus on. Um, Dr. Summerauer, do you have anything else you wanted to add here? No, I, you, you raise really good points. Um, you know, parents sometimes have to make decisions um, and what they can do in their day, right? Getting food on the table is an important, an important part of a parent's job, um, but taking time to get a lab test and trying to weigh those two is difficult. And from a practice perspective, you know, this lead doesn't pay, right? This is not a money 
moneymaker, but not that what we do should be about making money. It should be about doing what's right for our kids. And um, I think we'll show as we move forward that, you know, what we're talking about here today is really a little bit of extra time to do what's right for kids and to do what's right for society. These barriers are real. And as Ms. Masocha pointed out, we've even noticed discrepancies in tests ordered and tests obtained at our academic practice, um, where she showed that 80% of the kids who needed tests had them ordered, yet only 88% of those kids um, had them obtained, even though the lab is down the hall from the examination room. Um, one more stop is one more potential barrier. Um, one of the ways to improve testing is to test at the point of care rather than provide a lab requisition and hope that the parents are able to go to the lab for the test, let's bring the test to the patient. I like to call it point of care sampling. Point of care sampling has been shown to increase compliance with lead testing recommendations. <clears throat> One Australian study conducted between 2008 and 2012 found that the introduction of point of care testing increased the annual testing rate from 39 to 75% over the four year period. Furthermore, the same study found that the proportion of children screened at least once by 24 months of age increased from 63 to 98% over the same four year period. Similar results were published in 2021 by Carnahan and colleagues in Pennsylvania. Another benefit of point of care capillary sampling is the sensitivity and specificity of this method. Capillary testing has been shown to not produce false negatives. There are different methods for point of care testing, which include obtaining samples at the point of care that are then processed in the office with equipment available from various vendors, samples that are sent out for processing by national reference labs, or samples processed by your local hospital lab. The methods of collection can vary from micro retainers to blotter paper. In our experience, we found the most successful method to be collection on blotter paper. This method has been received as most agreeable by parents, staff, and most importantly, the patients. The specimen is collected during the child's visit, either by the nursing staff when they might be administering vaccines or by the provider. The vast majority of children seem to do very well with this collection method, and they seem intrigued by the process of the blood being absorbed by the filter paper. The entire collection process takes no longer than about 30 seconds. We've adopted this pictured workflow and encouraged this workflow to be adopted by all of our UH Rainbow Primary Care Institute practices. All patients who live in high-risk zip codes or have Medicaid insurance should have a blood lead level test. For patients with non-Medicaid insurance, the Ohio Department of Health lead questionnaire is provided to parents and guardians of all patients at one, two, three, four, and five years of age during their health maintenance and supervision exams. And if patients answer yes or I do not know to any of the questions, they then receive a capillary lead test. If your EMR allows, you may have the health maintenance practice alerts that can alert you to the need for testing. In our current system, we're not able to create these alerts based on zip code or insurance. And therefore, um, in my office, we prep the visits in advance with children who live in high risk zip codes or Medicaid insurance being queued up for blood sampling. Parents of children who do not meet these criteria are given the ODH questionnaire. As our system transitions to a new EMR vendor in 2023, we're working with that vendor to create these alerts in the EMR. An alternative is you could simply give the ODH questionnaire to all patients when they come in for their health maintenance and supervision visits at one to six years of age. The two-sided questionnaire controls for both Medicaid insurance as well as high-risk zip codes in questions one and two. Um, I think Alex is going to provide the link to the questionnaire in the chat box. Um, also, I'd like to point out that if you participate in the Ohio CPC for Kids program, um, that the metric for the lead testing requires one lead test before the age of two years. So that means if your child, if your patient arrives for the two-year visit and they're already two years old and they've not received a lead test, um, that lab test won't count to the metric. It's still important to get it done. I just want to be have everyone be aware on the call of how the CPC for Kids metric works. Um, for those practices who rely on clinical decision support available in your EMR, um, you may decide who don't rely or don't have that clinical decision support, excuse me, like we don't at the moment. Um, you may simply decide to provide the questionnaire 12, 15, and 18 months um, to catch those children for your CPC metric. 
In my practice, we have utilized point of care capillary collection for almost 20 years, and we've been able to keep our lead testing rates above 90%. I wanna be very clear, we do not process the samples in our office. We collect the sample and then we send it to the lab for analysis. Initially, when we started this process, we chose a national reference lab, which made the whole process very easy. The kits they sent us at no cost to our practice included alcohol swabs, bandages, lancets, even a paper towel. Wasn't quite sure what the paper towel was for. Um, the lab also took care of reporting to the state, which relieved a huge workload off of the office staff. We've now moved to centralized sample processing through university hospitals labs, which has streamlined the process and improved our data collection by bringing this all online into our EMR. As we transition to our new EMR at the beginning of next year, we anticipate no changes to our workflow or to our process. We also hope soon to be able to show some data on the improved testing rates in our system as our Rainbow Primary Care Institute practices move to this recommended workflow. In the end, your process will depend on your practice and your practice support network. You may have a local health system that can process the samples. I know this to be true at Cincinnati Children's. You may choose to purchase equipment and run the samples in your office. You may also choose to use a national reference lab as we initially did, even if it's simply to get the process started. For those of you that might be interested in purchasing the equipment and running the test in the office, I would like to caution you that the reporting requirements of the state of Ohio are very specific. And I include this slide here because these are the requirements for reporting. They look daunting, it's a lot, it can be done. We have one practice in our network that has been doing this and have not had issues, but reporting needs to be done within seven calendar days of obtaining the result. Capillary blood tests have proven to be both sensitive and specific. We've talked about that. They're also an efficient first step in our testing toolbox. Nonetheless, all capillary blood lead levels need to be repeated with venous draws. This is due to the concern for contamination on the skin, which can lead to falsely elevated blood lead levels. So what do you do with the results when you get them? As I've said, first and foremost, repeat with a venous draw. In our workflow, the parents are called and informed of the result and the importance of a venous check. Our experience has shown that once a preliminary diagnosis is made and direct outreach to the parents occurs, that in all cases, the repeat venous level is obtained. We're a bit spoiled. We don't have a loss to follow up in my office. Um, so that may be an issue for other practices, but getting this first capillary test is the most important piece we have in our armamentarium of battling lead poisoning in our society. Though the focus of our discussion today is really on screening and testing, it is important to know what to do when you get back an elevated blood lead level. These recommendations are based on the former cutoff of five micrograms per deciliter. As I mentioned in 2021, the CDC lowered the cutoff to 3.5 micrograms per deciliter. And these recommendations will be updated by the state. But all children with elevated blood lead levels are automatically eligible for early intervention, and you should complete a Bright Beginnings or Help Me Grow referral, particularly if you suspect a developmental delay. You should refer the family to your local health department for information purposes, tracking, and abatement if necessary based on level. Also consider testing for and addressing iron deficiency and encouraging a diet rich in calcium, vitamin C, and iron. Additional resources are also available through our local PACE branch. And that address, that web address is listed on the slide. Alex is also gonna provide this link in the chat. This is from the Ohio Department of Health. This is their health medical management recommendations for blood, increased blood lead levels and the specific treatment recommendations that our state has made. Again, this is based on the old cutoff of five micrograms per deciliter and will be updated um, down to the 3.5 microgram per deciliter level. We each are missing opportunities to screen and test children for lead poisoning. <clears throat> no amount of lead is safe. I think as we've tried to show in our talk today, lead is ubiquitous throughout Ohio. And the costs of lead poisoning are enormous to the individual and to society. 
I once did a talk on infant nutrition um, years ago. And um, when we talked about improving infant nutrition and how that might affect infant IQ. And the discussion point during that talk was, if we could increase the IQ of every child by one or two points for society, that would be a huge difference. Here we're talking about not lowering the IQ. How important is that for all of us? I implore you to take this information back to your practices and examine your workflows. Improve your screening and your testing. Let's all aim to test 100% of at-risk children. It's what's right for all of us. It's what needs to be done. Um, at this point, I'd like to open it up to discussion, but I'd, I'd like to start by saying that there are some states in our country that require 100% testing of all children. I think we need to point our discussion in that direction again. I'm about systems. I like simplicity. I think our current recommendation make it a little bit recommendations make it a little bit difficult sometimes in busy practices to, to decide who should get tested and who should not. It's a bigger discussion for a larger scale, but I'd like to maybe start off our discussion uh, with that. And with that, let's open it up to questions. Um, the last four slides are references for our talk. We'll flip those through slowly uh, as we go through this talk. I did notice in the chat, um, Betsy Lazarin made a comment earlier about leaded gasoline. Um, yes, <laughs> leaded gasoline. Um, you know, if you look at soil samples um, of homes around freeways and major motorways, uh, you can find lots of lead in those soil samples. And again, as Marie pointed out during our talk today, you know, a lot of that is based in these areas in the inner cities. Um, but there are places even in the suburbs where older motorways had lots of leaded gasoline. Um, and that's now reflected in those soil samples. Um, and then, um, Betsy, you also asked about companies that supply testing kits. Um, I didn't want this talk to be a um, commercial for anyone lab, but I will share with you that MedTox, which is a division of LabCorp, um, does this testing. They have a great program set up. They send you that. That kit, actually, that I had pictured in the talk um, is the kit from MedTox. I grayed out the name. Um, but they, they send you all the equipment you need to have this done. You mail it back to them in a postage paid envelope, and then they send you the result. Um, and I do know that they are integrated with some EMRs as well so that they can dump that information directly into your EMR. Um, also, if anyone would like to connect, I'll go ahead and I will put my email address into the chat. Please feel free to reach out to me. And with that, Alex, I'll turn it back over to you or Marie, did you have any more comments? No, uh, I think that if we have time and people want to share, I think that they can also, um, I'm curious as to other strategies or other workflows that work for other practices, um, because I think that this is just one um, and I think there are others out there. And so if you have anything that is, is working for your practice and you want to share, um, please do. And if you have anything that's not, you know, any questions or any, anything where you would like suggestions, um, or clarification, please either ask um, by unmuting or by writing in the chat. So Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Elizabeth Lazarin. Oh, oh no, go ahead, please. Okay, um, I'm Elizabeth Lazarin. I had asked that question about outside testing. Uh, we currently do not um, have lead testing performed within our office and we um, give parents a prescription to have the lead testing done at an offsite place, which is Children's Hospital three miles away. That results in less than 10% of the ones that we order actually getting back to us. <laughs> So that's why I was asking about something yeah. that we could do. We work within our family medicine practices within the 
the center, which is a large internal medicine based hospital system, and they don't have much bandwidth or desire to improve pediatric practices. So uh, we're trying to find what we can do within that system to make this happen. So bed talks. Where are you located, my, Dr. Lasserum? I, I hate to call out in a shaming way, okay. but um, okay. let me say Mount Auburn, which is an inner city area of Cincinnati. Yeah. And let you guess the hospital system. <laughs> So I do know that um, in my discussions with Dr. Nick Newman at Cincinnati Children's that they have the equipment there to run the tests. And I might, um, I, I don't know the specifics. He's already put it in the chat. He can help you. Um, my understanding is that they also will provide you with the tools you need to draw those samples in your office, uh, much like uh, MedTox does. That would be and, great. Um, I, he's already wrote, Betsy, I can help you in the chat. So Nick, thank you very much. Um, hey. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Um, it really does. You know, I can't I can't emphasize enough. And, you know, in prepping for this talk, Marie and I kept going back and forth because this has been so second nature for my practice for, for many years now. I can't emphasize enough how easy this process is and how it will improve the testing rates of the children in your practice. Um, it really is um, great. And that's not an ad. That's not an advertisement for the lab. That's just an advertisement for this process. Capillary testing does work. That's great. Angela Weber mentions in the chat um, that they're trying to standardize that all children at one and two get labs regardless of risk. And I think that's that's a fantastic goal. Um, and I would argue that we should be testing 100% of children because again, I think as we pointed out in our talk, the perception of this as a problem is different than the reality. And um, you know, I, I can speak to a couple practices that I've interacted with where their perceptions are that this is not you know, an issue for their patients. But yet when we look at the data and we increase the testing, they actually have more patients in their practices um, with lead poisoning than they realized. So Adam asks, how are your practices obtaining hemoglobin at one year of age with filter paper test for lead? In my practice, we have a hemoglobin machine in the office. So we didn't talk about that in, in um, our talk today, um, but we have a hemoglobin um, machine. And so the nurses obtain that blood at the same time and we get that hemoglobin result back at the same time. We had a and, question in the chat about um, our physician's advice to suggest vacuum cleaners with HEPA filters in order to prevent putting lead into the air. I'm not sure what the recommendation there is. Um, I will say that, that at the Center for Child Health and Policy, we've done a large scoping review. We haven't published it, but we have a lot of articles up until about 2020, and I need to go through and update those. So. Um, you know, there there is not a study that would su that suggests that has been done that suggests that that makes an impact. Um, but I don't think that it's necessarily a bad thing to to recommend. I just um, don't think there is specific um, advice. And I unfortunately, I wish I could point to a study that says this worked because there were a couple studies where they tried to like provide additional things such as vacuum cleaners to families and, and then went back to see if that made a difference. Um, but we don't have evidence for it. Um, I don't know if that helps. I don't know if, if Dr. Summer, or you have anything you want to add there? I don't. Um, I'm hoping that maybe Nick can chime in if he has anything there, but I've not come across any evidence um, supporting the use of HEPA filters. Um, it's an interesting thought, um, but I haven't come so, across that. So uh, if I understand, that's like a filter for the, the air? Like for the vacuum um, cleaner? Uh, yeah, so when they're the, vacuuming up. Yeah. So for the vacuum cleaner, um, I, I agree with uh, Marie, like I think uh, even like Cochrane has done a review of this too and hasn't found um, that re really um, that the HEPA vacuum is like that much better at, at, at you know, at, mostly you need to get rid of the source is the, is the you know, identify the source and get rid of it. Um, there, there are some studies looking at like how much do you need to vacuum and what type of surfaces and, and all this other stuff. And um, the, the upshot that my understanding of reading this literature is that it's better to clean than not clean, but it doesn't matter um, really all, all that much. And, and the truth is, is like the cleaning really only puts you in a situation to prevent the blood level from going over like 15 or 20. 
So it's very hard to clean your house down to a lead of, of zero, regardless of what you use. Mm -hmm. And the air filtration, I mean, the, the problem with lead is that it's so dense and so it settles very quickly. So if you have, I mean, there may be situations like in a, um, like a work site or something where there's a lot of dust being generated all the time, that some kind of filtration and air exchange would, be, would make uh, sense. But in a typical home setting where most of the lead is just settling out, uh, the dust is settling out, it, it, it probably is not gonna make a big impact like uh, in air filtration, so. I think there was another question from Laura Miller in the um, chat box as well. So recommended resources, additional treatment for a 20 month old patient with a lead level of 6.6 .6 initially at 14 months. And despite education and referral to ODH persistently had a level at 20 months of 5.7 with microcytic iron deficient anemia, which was treated now exhibiting speech delay. Patient has already referred to early intervention. Um, so the, the two suggestions I would have there, you've referred to ODH, I'm assuming that means your local county and that they came out and um, examined the home for lead abatement and found that not to be something they needed to do or is that something they did? Um, and then the second direction I would point you in is to PESO, um, uh, which Nick as well can comment on. He is our, our local representative, our regional representative for PESO here in Ohio. Um, but. Laura, did they did the county come out, or or I don't know where you are in the state, but did your local health board come out and examine the home for lead abatement possibilities? I'm not sure. I mean, I called um, Columbus, I think, um, mm -hmm. within the first month or two of the first le lead level being uh, um, elevated, and they said that <clears throat> they were opening a case, and they had called mom, talked to her about it, um, but. I mean, when I had called our local health department, they had referred me to um, ODH. Yeah, you know, know you if, raised, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. I don't know if anybody had come out locally, but um, mom is uh, not originally from the United States. I mean, she mm. speaks English well, but I, I, she's educated, um, but um, and she's worried about it, but I really have no idea if anybody has dealt with their housing, their apartment building or anything like that to, to try to help. Yeah, you know, you, you raise such an important issue on a high level, which is, you know, it's these low levels of lead exposure that lead to these um, delays. And I can tell you that in Cuyahoga County, they won't come out to the house and examine it for lead abatement unless it goes above 10. Um, and so this is that area in between where we're noticing an effect and, not much is being done about it. Um, and, you know, I'm going to make this commentary. I'm a pediatrician, so I'm going to say this. We as, as a country have been slow to act. The first calls to ban lead from paint were made in the 1920s with the Geneva Convention. The U.S. did not adopt that, neither did the U.K. Um, lead paint wasn't banned in the U.S. until 1978. Um, so, we continue to have to deal with the sequela from all of these delays and are still um, are still um, falling behind. Um, the Ohio State Legislature is currently looking at changing the definitions here. And I looked at the proposed bill. The proposed bill says that children are at risk for lead poisoning um, with a level above 3.5, but will not be diagnosed with lead poisoning unless it goes above 10, which actually moves it in the opposite direction from where we are currently, which is five micrograms per deciliter. Um, so these are things that we as pediatricians and, and child health advocates need to act on and talk about. Um, because the legislature has their agenda, um, but we need to have ours and we need to push that for our children. So please advise on how to refer. So Laura, please feel free to unmute yourself and, and you know, you know, just, just talk because this should be a bi-directional conversation. Thank you for putting it into the chat. Um, sure. Yeah, is there some... Yeah. yeah, I just was responding to somebody else's comment, but I, I oh. see somebody's messaged me about maybe talking to them because um, I, I've referred her to like the ODH 
and I'm not sure what else I can do, but yeah, I am concerned about the child's development. So I guess if I might chime in for a second, like I guess there's like Please. a couple of issues like kind of running all in, in parallel. So there's the there's the lead exposure, there's the uh, there's this uh, the iron deficiency, uh, which probably also has to be dealt with, which is also like a you know a neurodevelopmental risk factor, and then there's the kind of regulatory environment around the, the you know the the, the lead and. Um, Getting the kid connect to early interventions probably you know makes a lot of sense. Um, I think uh, the the way it's set up basically is like there's no um, the, the the services that might be provided for kids uh, with a lead level less than ten uh, can vary quite a bit from like one part of the state to the other. You know, the the city of Cincinnati has a, a actually a nurse visiting program where they go out to the home for those kids and if they find something that looks suggestive, they, you know, either take a sample of it or um, try to help the families get things together. If this is a kid uh, who's covered by Medicaid, um, they may be eligible to use the, the S-CHIP abatement grant, which does not require uh, even the, the B lead exposure. It's just that it's a, um, a child living in a home built before 1978, those, and they are on Medicaid. So that's the, the criteria so that might be another way out um, and then uh, I've had some families who had the means and they um, hired a private inspector and found out what the you know, where the lead problem was so um, it's um, yeah it's not it's not it's not a great it's not a great situation uh, for sure so I appreciate your help. <laughs> and if I if I can help uh, Laura, I, I don't know where you are, but like, you know, um, since I Children's has like a toll free number, you can always call um, and um, or you can uh, call the clinic. I can just send you a quick um, message um, with, with the information. So. Maybe we can try to help you offline. Sure. If you could send me maybe a message in the chat with your contact information, I can sure. reach out. Yeah, I'm in the Youngstown sure. area and I looked up the child zip code and it is in a high risk zone. So So Laura, I, I dropped off there for a minute and so I missed part of what was being said. But one thing I wanted to add was because I heard you say the the family is um of foreign origin, not that that should matter, but I have a, a large Indian patient population in my practice. And so they also um, will use a lot of cosmetics or imported spices. And we have found that sometimes those um, things can have some lead in them as well. So it'd be important to look at what the family is using to cook with, or if they have some ceremonial cosmetics they might be using, uh, that those might contain lead as well. Okay, I can try to look in to see if there's anything else going on. <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm happy to help Laura. So don't don't um, don't stress yourself out. Like this is like my job, basically. <laughs> I've heard that there are reports of um, imported jewelry, like bracelets, and the little yeah. children will suck on the bracelets and get lead poison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have this interesting situation where we have um, a large Indian population. Um, many of them are on work visas, and they all tend to live in the same complex, the same apartment complex. And the apartment complex has been evaluated by the county, by the state, and there's been no lead found. And we've actually, that's what led us down the road, exactly as you point out, jewelry, um, ceremonial powders and cosmetics, um, and some of the spices that they use to cook with. And again, I want to underscore that Dr. Nicholas Newman is our PESU representative, and he is the, the expert for all things lead, heavy metal, and environmental. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for your questions and your discussion. Thank you, Dr. Sumrauer and Marie um, and Dr. Newman for answering a few questions. Um, 
here at the end. We appreciate you all for joining. And there is one CME and one MOC part two credit available for attending this training. And I will send that out tomorrow. And please access our website for our resources um, with this recording, as well as with our PowerPoint slides. If there's any questions, please feel free to email me. And we look forward to hearing from you all soon. Thank you again to ODH for their support with this project. And thank you, Dr. Samara and Marie. Have a great um, Friday tomorrow and a good weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dr. Newman.